Welcome to Beyond the Flight Deck podcast with United Airlines pilot and investment advisor, Alan Buley, who will take you behind the scenes with airline pilot entrepreneurs, academics, and other professionals. And now, your host, Alan Buley. The Lost Decade. That phrase means different things to different people. Investors know it as 2000 to 2009, a decade where two-month T-bills outperformed the S&P 500. Airline pilots know it as roughly 2005 to 2014, depending on airline, where we flew under bankruptcy contracts. That decade shrunk the future pilot pool. It simply made no sense to invest tens of thousands of dollars above and beyond college in a profession where your starting salary qualified you for food stamps. As a result, airlines are facing a potential pilot shortage. To combat this, United Airlines launched the Aviate program and Aviate Academy, giving aspiring pilots a path to becoming a pilot for United Airlines. The Aviate program offers multiple entry points, leading candidates to one of three avenues through which they can transition to the pilot ranks at United. Now on March 1st, 2023, with feedback from industry partners, Aviate leadership announced program changes that should expedite the process for current and future Aviate candidates. Now, while Aviate does not guarantee the fastest path to a seniority number, it does guarantee a number, assuming the candidate continues to satisfy the program requirements. Today, I'm joined by Perry Lewis, Director of Aviate and Pilot Strategy for United Airlines. Perry graduated from Embry-Riddle, spent an amazing four years working for NASA, and joined Continental Airlines in 2011 as a dispatcher when the space shuttle program was shut down. Since the merger with United, he's been a dispatcher instructor, manager of flight operations, fuel efficiency and reliability, and senior manager of tech ops project planning. Welcome Beyond the Flight Deck. Barry Lewis, welcome Beyond the Flight Deck. Thanks for sitting with me today. Thank you very much, Alan. Yeah, it's great to have you here. A lot of questions about Aviate out there in the, uh, not only the pilot ranks, but people that are interested in becoming pilots. So before we dive into that, let's talk just a couple of minutes about who you are and how you got to be here, the uh, director of Aviate and Pilot Strategy for United Airlines. Um, Where are you from? Where are you born? Uh, What your parents do for a living? Yeah. So uh, thank you. I was uh, originally from a small town in Indiana, Frankfort, Indiana. High school mascot was the hot dog. So if that gives you any indication how small the town it was. Um, uh, I have uh, two sisters. Uh, my dad owned a car dealership. My mom worked at the high school. So a uh, very simple upbringing. Yeah, very good. Uh, and I see you started college there in Purdue. Um, when you graduated high school, uh, Perry Lewis was most likely to blank. <laughs> Uh, move out of Frankfurt. No, um, you know, I'd always chased a dream ever since, say, the movie Apollo 13, uh, wanted to work for NASA. So maybe we'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, but that, but that was it. And um, my, my stint at Purdue was uh, short. I actually finished uh, all my high school classes within three years. So uh, I didn't want to waste any time. So I went ahead and attended Purdue um, for a year before eventually going to Embry Riddle in Florida. Okay. And what did you study at Riddle? Uh, Aerospace engineering and mathematics. Okay. They go hand in hand, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, when you graduated Riddle, uh, you did a very short stint at a company, Bastille Bastille Perimeter Systems. What was that? Yeah. uh, I was the uh, senior sales engineer there. I had a friend that owned the company and it really gave me an opportunity to learn a lot about business, which is also uh, of interest to me. Uh, so I did that back in my hometown as well. Oh, cool. Okay. Now comes the cool part of your career. Not to say what you're doing now is not cool, but you spent a couple of years at NASA. Walk us through what it likes go what's it like going to work for NASA and what were your job roles there? Kind of how that played out over those about what, four years? Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. And thank you for asking about that. Um I, I did I spent four years at NASA. I started there as a flight controller and mission control for the space shuttle program. Um, And that was an amazing opportunity uh, while we had the space shuttle. 
Um, you would normally get a mission that's about 18 months out. Uh, you'd spend that time um, putting together what what 12 days in space is going to look like, the uh, the objectives of the astronaut, you get your astronaut team, you teach them how they're going to do the mission because every mission is unique and these were all focused around constructing the space station. So then you go through the generic training, the mission specific training, uh, you launch and you sit in mission control uh, why the astronauts execute the mission. It was really fascinating and exciting to do. And then once they retired the space shuttle, uh, I ended up moving over and was a astronaut instructor for the space station. And that was a great opportunity and kind of train astronauts for that and also sit in mission control. Uh, but it didn't have the exact uh, zing that a 12 day space shuttle mission had. Um, so that's when uh, I just kind of opened my eyes to other industries that had uh, operations 24 seven, highly paced, where there were problems and logist logistics to be solved. And that's when uh, Continental at the time caught my eye. Very good. Um, so in your early, those first, when you were working on that 18 month lead up to a mission, you worked hand in hand with the astronauts training, like you said, basic variable and then train specific for that mission. So you worked hand in hand with the astronauts. Yeah, I did. It was um, the way they do it is we had around 120 astronauts and they would all go through uh, general type uh, astronaut training. So there was a lot of work on extra extravehicular activities, so EVAs, space watch that you see. My focus was in all the robotic operations, so the robotic arms that were on both the space shuttle uh, and the space station, and that's what you use to install the uh, modules onto the space station. So we would train astronauts um, in general kinematics and, and how uh, the arm works in space. And then once you get a mission, you know exactly what module you're using, what you're installing, you know, what your timeline looks like, you know, um, what day uh, these different tasks are going to occur. So you have to kind of um, integrate both spacewalks and these robotic operations hand in hand throughout the time that they're up there. Uh, and what's really incredible is we think about mission plane and even in flight ops, we've been for pilots uh, for the, the space shuttle. Uh, you have seven astronauts on the space shuttle and the mission is in five minute increments. So you might have astronaut one and three doing something, but then, you know, 15 minutes later, one and four need to do something. Then 15 minutes later, four and two need to do something. Uh, so this, these missions are so tightly woven in order to, to have success that made uh, every day exciting because no day went exactly as planned. So you had the, the, the evening, they kind of throw it, uh, the rest of the mission together, redesign it, and you came back for day two. Then in day two, you do it again for day three. Um, and really kept everyone on their toes. And I've never, you know, have seen anything like a room full of mission controllers at NASA is a really sharp group. I, I listened to a podcast with a Canadian astronaut. And the one thing he highlighted the most about it is you train and train and train and train, but nothing ever goes as planned. Yeah, we had to put together a procedures book and the nominal procedures book is usually about, I don't know, this 50 pages, 60 pages for robotic operations. The non-nominal is 200 plus pages, right? You know, so you always have uh, the contingencies are spend most of your, what you spend most of your time planning for. Wow. All right. So you uh, leave NASA for Continental in 2011. I mean, uh, was that not a little bit of a buzzkill going from helping astronauts get in space and complete missions to being a flight dispatcher? It, you know, it, it was a little bit humbling going from like the brand recognition. And I will say that Continental and uh, United, the merger had already been announced. So I, I knew that it was going to be United. Uh, I knew that it was going to take me here to Chicago, which being from Indiana was definitely a perk. Uh, but I, I'll tell you, the whole interest came about when I was flying into Houston one day, looked out the window of an airplane. And I'll tell you, even at that time, I couldn't have told you what airline, you know, I'd flown on the time before that. The time before that, there was no real, I guess, brand loyalty or recognition at the time. Um, I just wasn't really all that familiar with the aviation industry. But I looked out and saw all these aircraft and all these tails and thought, all right, all of these planes are going to go fly elsewhere. And then there's going to be a whole new set of planes that come in. And then they're all going to fly out. And in my role, I was worried about one tail, right? The space shuttle. That was one mission, one tail. You watched it all the time. But how is this working? How is this happening? Um, who's, who's controlling this? Where's their mission control? And I asked a friend, um, 
who happened to be in procurement and they didn't know, but they knew someone who knew someone. And I got a, a an opportunity to tour the uh, the NOC in Houston at the time. And when I saw all these aircraft in the air all over the world, all at the same time, in a room full of these dispatchers that you know had their hands directly in the operation, I was blown away. So um, you know, even coming from NASA and seeing what those men and women are doing in the NOC and how they they don't get an opportunity to to land the space shuttle and to rest and to you know recoup before going on another one. It is day after day after day, and the you know the hundreds of thousands of people that are flying the thousands of aircraft that that blew me away. Even after seeing the operations that I had seen, um, so no, I was fascinated by the operation, and I was looking forward to the opportunity to to do that. Yeah. Uh, so you spent a couple of years as a dispatcher, dispatch instructor. Uh, then you move into a fuel efficiency and, and operational reliability uh, role. What did that entail? Yeah, it's really interesting. I've always let uh, my curiosity kind of fuel my my career path, and you know, being curious about the planes led me, you know, to the airlines. Um, as a dispatcher, you know, and I'm sure as a pilot, you're familiar uh, with you know REMF, and we went through how to plan fuel properly. And, and I think, as most people know, um, if you ferry fuel, it costs money, and it costs fuel, and uh, I found as a dispatcher, it very interesting to know when I put a lot of fuel on, it really reduced your phone calls, right? And and you, uh, as a dispatcher, about time management, right? You have so many um, aircraft that you have to flight follow and flight plan. And if you're having to adjust fuel loads, that takes away from your time to manage the other aspects. So you could you know, put a lot of fuel on, but that's also wasting fuel and not needed. But, and I noticed that when you put less fuel on or down to a certain point, you might get that phone call asking for more fuel. And then that replanning takes time. So I, I was doing a bunch of my own studies and seeing exactly what was that sweet spot where I could put enough fuel on to satisfy both myself and the pilot, but also not too much that I was, um, ferrying fuel and, 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 and making the aircraft way more than it needed to be. And, you know, burn more fuel. Uh, so just like getting really interested in efficiencies. Uh, and then we had um, Captain Alan Twig speak to the dispatchers on behalf of the pilots. And he was talking about REMF and and the fuel. I just had all these questions and lo and behold, he was, he was hiring uh, a manager of um, fuel efficiency and operational reliability. And that's how that came to be. So it really was this, this interest that I had before even knowing that there was such a job and having uh, the luck to be connected um, with Captain Twig and and getting that opportunity. So being in that role, um, I got to do operational efficiency training where I got to go out and meet all the pilots and talk about flight planning, uh, what the dispatcher does um, and, and fuel efficiencies. And it was a really cool opportunity to really see uh, the operation firsthand and also uh, talk with the pilots and hear about all of your considerations. Sure. And, you know, my comfort level for fuel minimums is different from other 67 captains uh, and even different on what leg we're flying. So uh, that sweet spot you're talking about is, you know, it's not necessarily a narrow range uh, because you are dealing with several thousand captains and several thousand different missions. So um, that's interesting. All right, so you work with that for a little bit, and then you hop over to tech ops and leave flight ops for a little while. Yeah, uh, that was a really interesting role. I got an uh, opportunity to be senior manager of project planning. So uh, I want a different look at the operation. Um, there is an operation when the plane's in the air, and there's an operation when the plane's on the ground. And I was as familiar with those ground operations. So um, being in tech ops, you learn all about like, the supply chain management and the line checks and the heavy checks. and all these aircraft modifications that are in the work all the time across all of our fleet. So I had a team um, that looked at all of these modifications. They could have been anything from carbon brakes to maybe an SA mandate um, to the player seats. Uh, we had about a thousand different types of projects that spanned all of our fleet. So there were tens of thousands of different operations that the team managed and some can be done on um, checks and uh, uh, on the line and some need to be more heavy checks 
that were done, um, you know, over several days in the station. So trying to figure all those logistics out was also just something that really interests me. I had great opportunity to do that for a couple of years. Yeah, something that a lot of customers don't think about, surely not a lot of employees, is a lot of the aircraft routing is based on maintenance, not just putting the right aircraft configuration uh, on the right market. And there's so many variables there. And a lot of people don't think, oh, well, it may be going over to somewhere tonight because it's having a small check done overnight in Des Moines or something. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's incredible, you know, how the team is calculating all the cycles right on, on, on the engine and, and the landings and looking at when these come due and try to uh, space these things out because if you do it too early then you're just kind of wasting time right but if you wait too late then you risk maybe uh, a delay or that aircraft not getting on time and then it's going to sit on the ground and wait so the efficiencies uh that those uh base planners do is is just something to watch yeah i bet that's uh they always tell us when we call and ask questions, well, you don't have the big picture. I've been hearing that for 27 years now. <laughs> um, okay. So then Aviate is born. Uh, you join Aviate in at the end of 19. Um, were you the first person in your role at Aviate or has that changed? Yeah, uh, I was the first person. Uh, there was a MD of Aviate and pilot strategy that worked with a consultant group that developed the program. Uh, it launched in October of 2019. Then as the consultant team was rolling off, I got hired into my role. So I was the first employee of that MD um, to, to work for Aviate. Okay. And so just so everyone understands, there are two different things we're talking about here. We're going to focus on one, but one is the Aviate Academy, the physical flight school in Arizona, which uh, Perry doesn't have really anything to do with. And then there's the Aviate program. So in a couple of words, what's the point? Why did Aviate the program become a thing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And thank you for that distinction. We, of, we often have to, when people talk about Aviate, you always have to follow up with the academy of the program. So you're exactly right. Uh, the, the program is the aspect of, of Aviate that I work on. And we have a very capable team uh, ran by Dana Donati over in Phoenix that runs the academy. So yeah, so you know the the AB the program was really born out of um, and and I I came in late, right? Hadn't had an opportunity to do it, but I I could see even when I was in college, right? I would, uh, despite not being uh, a pilot myself, I had friends, fraternity brothers that were all pilots, and they would ask, I could you know uh, amongst each other, I know I want to fly for a major, but how do I get there? Um, do I, um, do I just, do I, do I CFI and then go to their, their regional? Do they, do they appreciate that loyalty? Do I go fly for a competitor so they can fly me away? Do I go into the military? Do I try to go for a low cost carrier so I can be type right in the type of aircraft that they have? Do I just fly as, do I just banner toast so I can get as many uh, hours as possible? That there was just this, um, ambiguity of, I know what I want to get, but how do I get there? And then what's crazy, having stepped in AD, I see like the airline knows exactly what they want out of someone. They just need to be able to communicate that back. And in AD, you just took it one step further. They said, not only are we going to communicate it back, but we're going to develop a program around it. And now that we're going to develop a program around it, we're going to provide you the certainty so that you can continue to invest yourself in yourself. You can invest your time, your money. It's certainly not cheap to become a pilot. Um, with that guarantee, uh, that if you if you follow the program, meet the conditions, that there is a job waiting for you, right? So, you know, I also saw a lot of really talented people uh, that I went to college with who over time said, you know what, I just don't know if that goal is attainable. I just don't know if I'm going to get there. This is very expensive. At the time, it took six, seven, eight, nine years at a regional with not necessarily great pay. So it was a huge risk. And they thought, no, I'm going to jump to ATC. Or I'm going to jump to airport management. That is a, a safer bet. And we, what we want to do in Aviate is provide that equal, if not safer bet on yourself um, and that that conditional job offer from United um, so that we don't see people um, uh, a trit off from their path and and stay as, as pilots and work towards coming to United and make it the most secure, direct path that we can uh, to join us here. Um, 
it, but things have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. We, you know, due to the bankruptcies, United, Delta, um, American, everybody, US Air, Continental twice. I mean, like you said, there was a decade where people thought it was nuts to go spend $100,000 on an education to come to a job that pays $18,000 a year. That landscape's changed, right? And now there's a big demand for pilots. So how does Aviate fit into that new mold? Uh, or does the purpose of Aviate, is it somehow work with this new need for pilots that they're struggling to get in some ways, or they think they may over time? Because yeah. and let's be clear, there's there are debates on why we might have a pilot shortage. Well, when you don't pay people what they're worth for a decade, you're not going to get people. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's economics, right? There's period. Yeah. And it's, it's a great time to be a pilot right now with so much growth in the industry and so much opportunity. And and you see that with United and and their uh, aircraft uh, order uh, to show that commitment to, to that growth. So uh, yeah, when, when AD was designed in 2019, that would, the, the landscape didn't even exist then as it does today. Right. And what we wanted to do was create a pipeline. So people knew that they were going to have the opportunity to come to United aviate has been, and continues to be, um, United's top priority when looking at filling our, our, our classrooms, um, and our class dates. So we were building this pi- pipeline that said, okay you know, get in line and we are going to follow you in into United. And as the growth occurs, we are, we are seeing um, that the experience levels um, are coming down. Now that's not to say the talent's coming down. That's not to say that uh, these are any less pilots, but just the number of hours that these pilots have had um, historically were at 6,000 hours turbine 7,000 hours. And we're seeing that, that come down. And um, that makes it that 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 required us to rethink what Aviate is, and those are the changes that just came out last week. And in, in answer of that, so what we realized was um, there are going to be instances in which someone can go to a non-Aviate partner and possibly get to United sooner. And that's what everyone I think everyone's mindset has shifted from. I just want to get to an airline to. I now want to get there the fastest, right? Well, I, it's always been the fastest to get to a major, right? Because it's all about seniority. I mean, when my dad retired after 33 years, like the last thing he said was, as he walked out the cockpit door, he's like, man, I just wish I could give you my seniority number, right? You know, so it's it, it's always been the fastest. However, it you know, it's not the fastest to fly by night cargo carrier versus United American Delta Continental, you know, right? So, uh, yeah. You're, you're exactly right. And I feel that what fast this is, I think what the expectation is, has drastically changed over the three, four years. So fast before could have been six years. Fast today is three years, yeah. two years, yeah. right? And so we'll talk about that with the new changes that just came out. So, yes. which is why we're doing this after March 1st uh, as yeah. opposed to before. Um, so I, I just want to get this elephant out in the room. There, if you if you are an online jockey and you get on to even United flying together when they announce when they put up everything about Aviate, it's all about fifty percent are going to be diverse, uh, you know, women or uh, minorities, whatever. Um, take that as you may, but the world is brutal, and there's a lot of people looking at that like, wait a minute, I want the best pilot, not you know a, a picture of a pilot. Um, but you and I talked about this before there was kind of more behind that as opposed to just United Airlines virtue signaling, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and I will say when we, when we talk about the diversity and the goals there, that is a part of the United Aviate Academy, not the, uh, Aviate program itself. So, right. and, and the reason that's, you know, luckily, and, and I do, I work hand in hand with the Academy. Um, because everyone that's at the academy, once they get their private, they they get into AVA. So now they're a part of the program. And the program is what takes them from the academy through their experience build, through their time at one of our UX carriers or one of our part 135 partners, all the way to United. So the program pays, plays a big part in those that are attending the academy. So where this um, uh, DEI initiative comes in with the academy um, is the fact that when you look at the makeup of our current flight decks, they are as diverse as they could be. And it just shows that we are haven't 
than necessarily marketing and providing those opportunities to those underrepresented communities. And that's what this has been about. And it's been incredibly successful. Um, you know, luckily, uh, when I got my mandate for my job, it was to help support the United Pipeline. What it wasn't was make sure the competitors also don't have pilots, right? So Aviate, what we want to do is get people in our program to come to United. What the Academy is also doing is just growing that pie bigger. It is just showing people who never saw themselves as being pilots um, that they they can do it. And I think it, it really takes away kind of what I talked about earlier about seeing becoming a pilot as just unattainable. And we want to say it is, and these are the steps, and we're here to break down those barriers that may have kept you from thinking about doing them before. So, um, and, and there isn't any type of, I think people are concerned about there being like quotas or discrimination, the selection process. Um, I want to say the last I heard, we had 28,000 applications for the Academy wow. and the makeup of the Academy is representative of those that have applied. So the same percentages of student body that you see at the Academy is the same percentage of those that are putting an application. So there is, you know, there's no, there's no discrimination in the selection. It is really the um, incredible job by the the marketing team and the communications team to really get the word out there uh, to people that may not have saw themselves in the flight deck. Hey, you can do this, and United is providing you a path on how to do it. So right. we've okay. just made it, you know, uh, easier to digest and to understand the path. And it isn't the case where oh, I know someone or a family member or a neighbor is a pilot, therefore I now know how to become a pilot. We want to provide everyone that information. Yeah, because you need to make that pie bigger. If we, in fact, do have a pilot shortage, then you need to reach out to people that never were, never thought about being a pilot and see if they're interested just to fill this need of pilots in the future. All right. So let's now talk about uh, Aviate. There were some big changes made. I don't really want to talk about old versus new. Let's just yeah. talk about what's going on pretty much March 1st and forward, but also of great importance to a lot of people that are going to watch this because a lot of pilots' kids are working in or already in the Aviate program or working towards it. What happens to those people? Okay. So you've got your five entry points into Aviate. Um, we've got universities. So you've got the Embry-Riddles, the Auburn Universities, and several others. Uh, you've got, um, oh, I did have one question. What about universities on the West Coast? They're mostly, you know, middle of the U.S. and East. Are you, is, do you know if you guys are still working on getting more universities? Yeah, we have a, uh, I think a list of over a hundred uh, universities and flight schools that we're currently evaluating. Um, but right now, what we're focused on is be able to have that engagement with those that are partners. And we want to stretch ourselves to then. So we do have universities um, that 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 veer stretch more uh, to the West. We're actually working on one right now that we hope to announce here in a couple of months. Um, but we our main focus is be able to, to, to provide that engagement, that recruitment, having boots on the ground at the universities that we're currently partnered with. Okay. So university is number one. Uh, the next one's a professional flight training, uh, I assume a 141 school, like an ATP or something like that. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and then another one, experience. Uh, you're a CFI at a participating university or participating flight school, 141 school. Um, you work for one of the participating UAX carriers currently, correct? Uh, and then the last one is the one that people like myself would be interested in, which is the United Family right uh where uh if you're a son or daughter of a current employee or you're a current employee or you know, a few other little qualifications there okay so those are five entry points um and then but there's some eligibility right according to the document you've got to have your private already mm -hmm. um you've got to have your physical um high school diploma or ged which if you're in college you probably do but the other places maybe not um and you can't exceed a max number of temp attempts at applying to the program okay so basically you have us you know someone that graduates high school or gets an e, a ged and gets their private whether it's at the ava academy or emory riddle or an auburn or a, an atp but as soon as they get their private they got their medical they got their private um they can apply correct yeah. and that okay um what uh um what if they're well let me ask you this um 
has that always been kind of the case or is that that list of five, is that new or has that pretty much been the case so far? That is um, when we first launched, we, we did, we rolled out in phases, uh, but within the first six, seven months, those entry points have been the entry points we have always had. So, okay. um, and those did not change with our new updates. Okay. Do you know the success fail rate of applicants uh, getting accepted? into the into the pipeline and is there any common reasons why people aren't getting accepted that aren't yeah so um it, it depends i think on on where that uh applicant comes from in their journey right you know whether they're coming directly out of getting a private or commercial we had different interviews based on someone's um uh level of certs and ratings uh, you know, we wouldn't want to give someone uh, that just got their private the same level of interview that someone that has, you know, 500 hours. So, um, you know, as far as splicing that way, the the success rate really varies. And there isn't one certain area um, that we have seen higher failure rates from. Otherwise, we would have, you know, reevaluated having that as, a, as an entry point. As far as success rates, um, if you look at it all together, I would say it's probably between 70 and 80% of a success rate for, for an interview. Okay. Um, what's, uh, once you're in, let's say for example, you have a, uh, uh, someone that is, um, going to school at night and doing their flight training at ATP or something like that. And they're working on their college degree. They've got a high school diploma and, um, let's say they get accepted into aviate they get all their ratings do they then to stay in aviate have to go to a participating uax or participating 135 or the other next place is an fti in the training center um do they have to do that or once they're already in aviate could they then go fly for a carrier that might be favorable to delta or american for example yeah, that's a really great question. And and I, I'm going to back it up a little bit. So when the program first came out, the expectation was that someone who joins the program at any entry point must stay within the ecosystem all the way to United. And that just really wasn't working because it is difficult to find those experienced of hours. So for someone at an ATP who finishes their, their commercial, their instrument, maybe their CFI, and now they're trying to find work within the ecosystem, sometimes that would be tough. So what we've done is um, one change that we have made and we made this last year was to allow those that did get their training at a Embry-Riddle or not an Embry-Riddle, but a, uh, or at an Embry-Riddle or any one of our other university type partners to go off and get that experience however they see fit, right? Whatever works for them, whatever's convenient for them, because we don't want to delay their ability to build those hours. However, everyone in the program needs to eventually come back to like this final phase um, that, that you are mentioning. So uh, there are, as you said, three different ways that you can transition to United. One of those is through one of our three UAX carrier partners. The other is through one of our two um, different Part 135 partners. And then the other is to become an FTI at United at the FTC. Okay, so if they graduate a riddle, and so let's say they they get into the pipeline while they're at a riddle or, or working at a 141 through the AV8 family, whatever, um, once they get all their ratings and their CFI, they could then, if they wanted to, go back to their home airport and instruct and, and, and apply for a job at UAX, one of the three UAX carriers that, that are participating or the 135 operations or the training center. And once they qualify, once they get picked up at one of those places, they have to do that. In other words, from the AV8 uh, pipeline, they will not get hired at United out of a non-UAX participating carrier. They will have to go to one of those first. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and one, one thing I will mention is that you said that you have interest in this. In our family programs, what we've done for our families, so that's uh, our own employees at United that want to become pilots or dependents of employees we've allowed them to apply and get an AV without being at a partner. So um, if there is a, a son or daughter that's interested in becoming a pilot, they can, once they get their private pilot license, apply to aviate, get an AV. It doesn't matter where they are, are training. Um, they can continue their training at their local airport 
uh, CFI there. They can they can work in any manner that that provides them that experience and that hours build. And then they just need to come over during that final stage that we mentioned. So we've opened it up, and there's opportunities uh, for those in the family program. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So and then they would just be really need to decide whether they want a 141 school or non 141. Obviously, the faster path or but more expensive would be a 141. Uh, for FA requirements. So, okay. So an aviate um, family, uh, if you have your private, you've got your high school diploma or GED, a private medical in, in that, and you have not exceeded an attempt to to join AV or to be accepted in AV, then if you get in, then it's kind of up to you where you want to go from there. But ultimately, you need to try and get hired by one of the three UAX carriers. Who are the two 135 operators? Yeah, so we have... Um uh, Ameriflight, um, and they also uh, have another operating arm called Wiggins. So both Ameriflight and Wiggins, and then we have uh, JSX. So those are our Part One Thirty Five partners. Okay, and then the last piece is uh, an FDI in the training center. Who I've I've met one of our FDIs out there who's in the AV eight. Um, okay, so there's so there's basically a couple of in, there, there's two really transitions. There's entrance into the program itself which is we talked about those five different ways that you can enter in the program, but talked about the, the four eligibility requirements. All right, so once you are in the EVA pipeline, then you have that first transition to one of those three, the UX carrier, the, the one of the two 135s or the FTI. Okay, now we've got these requirements to then go from a United Express, say for example, on to United. So let's walk through a little bit about what are the basic qualifications, what experience timeline you have to have at one of the three UAX carriers, for example, to then get on with United. Yeah. So it's great is after making these changes, I can say that very simply and say it is 1600 hours of PIC time at the UAX carrier. Now, if someone um, does interview and gets into Aviate prior to being at a UAX carrier, uh, we allow a credit of 400 hours. So it's only 1200 hours a PIC time at that carrier. Now, there there are, there are other dimensions that we Wait, do review. All right, say that again. Where does the 400 hour reduction come in? Yeah, so for those that interview to get an Aviate, so those that um, enter Aviate prior to being at a UAX carrier, so those entry points that you mentioned, yep. whether it's through a university, a flight school, a part 135, or the family programs, those four uh, they have access to a credit. They will be given a 400 hours of PIC credit. So their transition requirement is just 1,200 hours in the left seat. Okay. So if you're a pilot listening to this and your son or daughter gets on with a with an express carrier, you're only they're only going to have to have, if they're hired March 1st of this year or later, uh, or enter the program and then uh, start with that that company after July 1st, I believe, these are the requirements for them 1200 hours for example if this is a son or daughter of a current employee or a current employee um okay um so let's say you've got that son or daughter who is stuck in the right seat they're not flying enough um and what other options do they have they, they've probably got applications on with delta on with american on with southwest whoever else fedex um what other if if can they also apply united outside of the ava pipeline if they're in it yeah that's a that's a really great question and i'll just caveat the previous statement a little bit to say if that son or daughter they must have applied to ava prior to being at the uax carrier. correct yeah so yeah, they have to um, come through the entry points yes yeah exactly uh so for someone that's that's in, in the right seat right now that may not be getting the number of hours that they wish to give or, or get um, to progress at a rate they'd like to progress in order to meet these requirements. What's really great about these changes is that because it does have a PIC requirement, you're going to be seeing a lot of people flow from the right seat to the left seat. There's a lot more hours to be earned in the left seat. And by having more people move to the left seat, that's going to provide many more hours to the person in the right seat. So we're going to see that pick up uh, here uh, at any time, right? Um, we also allow time served um, in this program out of UAX cares to be cumulative. So if someone is sitting at one airline and they just don't think that they're getting the hours that they may see at another UAX partner, 
they can leave that partner, go to the other one, and their time will continue. They do not start over. So um, having that amongst uh, that flexibility amongst our, our partnerships, I think is very helpful as well. Okay. So there's no total time requirement at all. It is just the 1600 that can be reducible to 1200 if you go through the other one of the other four uh, entry points into the pipeline. Yeah, itself. Okay. that's correct. And I know you asked about traditional, so I don't want to uh, gloss over that. So um, our participants and anyone at UAX is welcome to apply traditionally. Um, the only thing that happens if you are in the EVA program and you apply and you get awarded an interview and you schedule that interview, at that point, we do remove you from the ADA program. Uh, we don't want to create a system, especially for a pilot hiring team, where everyone's, I guess, trying to double dip, right? Where they've interviewed them, brought them into the ADA program, have them there, and then that same group of people are now interviewing traditionally. It just doesn't work. So uh, ADA is the most secure, direct path. And um, if you decide that you want to go and try to apply traditionally, we are fine with that. You know, we want to we want to welcome you to United, but then it gives up some of that security, and you're kind of you're betting on yourself in that interview to to get that role. Right. So it may be faster or not. In other words, if you get to the interview and the interview doesn't go well, and you've given up your Aviate slot, there goes your guaranteed job. But it could also work out if you felt you interviewed well the first time through Aviate, and you think you'll do well with the HR and pilot interviewers. You know, it's just a risk that every every person, every applicant is going to have to make that decision for themselves. Yeah, and um, we do get a question a lot about, well, will that will that be frowned upon? And I can tell you, it is not. Okay. If someone decides to bet on themselves, that is perfectly fine. And and in the interview and in that selection process, traditionally, um, if you were in the program and you left the program, uh, that that doesn't hurt anyone. Beyond the Flight Deck is brought to you by United Wealth Management, a leader in PRAP management and financial planning by United Pilots for United Pilots since 2005. We offer what the PRAP cannot, personal, professional financial care, a true financial co-pilot. To learn more, we invite you to be in touch. Let's say you're in Aviate, you're, you're at one of the UAX carriers, you're struggling to get the PIC time, they're not upgrading you, but by the way, you get a call from Delta and you go interview with Delta and you accept the job with Delta, do you have to pull out of the AVA pipeline? Yeah, so a part of AVA is the continuous progression towards transitioning uh, to, to United. So if you leave that carrier and fly for Delta, you are no longer progressing towards your transition requirements to come. So uh, you will be removed from the program if that if that is the case um, for someone. Yeah, sure. Because they're not at that transition point, the UAX or 135 or FTI. Okay. Um, if, if you have someone that, let's say, for example, one of my boys decides to do this one day and they enter through the Aviate family, we figure out how we're going to get their education, their ratings and all that stuff. Um, and then they make their way to say one of the UX carriers. Um, are we getting any more consideration as current employees or sons and daughters of current employees to get plucked for an interview? Or are we just in a field amongst everyone else? Is there any uh, preference, not so much in once you walk into the interview, but to get to the interview? Is there any preference? And I'm really glad that you asked that question because we've worked with our UX carriers and ensuring that we've developed a program that does incentivize the carrier to want to hire people in the AVA program. So because there's that uh, PIC hour uh, requirement attached to it, and those carriers say, if I hire this person, I know that they're going to be incentivized to fly uh, a, a lot, right? Because it's all based on how you gain your time. And they're going to be incentivized as soon as possible to move to the left seat so they can meet those transition requirements. So we've created the perfect candidate for the UX carrier. So it really benefits both the participant and the carrier. Okay. But so let's say they're there, they've met the the time requirements. Is there any, um, I, I get, well, is there any then when it's time, when you hit that 1600 hours or 1200, if you've come through one of the other four, when you hit that time, you what submit everything to United saying, Hey, these are all, these are the records from the, the, the UAX carrier. This shows that I've met your requirements. What happens now? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. I'm going to back up to where I think AV has missed the mark over the past several years. Um, the the program had uh, introduced a a flow rate, um, so we know that people would meet their requirements, and then they'd have to wait for people that were in front of them to right. flow to United, and we bring people through. And there is this this black box, this ambiguousness of of when am I coming? I don't know. I don't have people in front of me. I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm not seeing my progression. And with these updates that we just made on March 3rd, we have eliminated all of that. So it is, you meet your requirement, which is for some 1600 hours, some 1200 hours. And within four months of meeting that, you will be on United property. It's not, well, we'll promise we'll assign you a date that sometime in the future that the team will immediately start working on uh, your transition to United. What is the responsibility of the participant is to let us know when you believe you have met that requirement. And then we will work with the carrier to get those documents. So there, there isn't any documents unless specifically asked uh, from the participant, which really great. I'm going to plug this for a moment is that we're coming out with new technology. We're coming out with a My Aviate mobile app that all of our participants will have that they can actually enter their progressions. They can type in how many hours they have. They can type in their search, their ratings. They can type in their current employer. And what it will do in real time is calculate back to them. This is your progression. These are the things that you need to do. This is your next step. Or we've seen that you've completed all your requirements. Please click submit. And then that alerts us to start that process. And our commitment is within four months of hitting that, uh, I've met my commitment button that we will have you on property. Now, I've talked to the hiring team. They believe it takes maybe two, usually at most three months. Um, so it's actually going to be sooner than that four months, but we want to make sure that we don't miss our commitment. So we've provided a four month time frame. Okay. So yeah, my, my original question a few minutes ago, now it makes a lot of sense. Basically, if you're a United pilot today, who's got a son or daughter or you're a current employee that wants to get on, get in through the Aviate family, right? Because once you're in that and you can get all your education requirements, all the everything done, you can get on with the UAX carriers. Now you're not fighting the rest of the world, right? Now it's just a matter of, you know, the thing you may fight is I'm sitting over here getting nothing but SIC time, right? And so, but hopefully, like you said, this will incentivize more people to upgrade sooner, get their 12 to 1600 hours PIC and moved on. So, because um, one of the biggest complaints I've seen, and you've seen it too, is I, my, you know, this guy who was a ramper and is now at a UAX carrier is rotting, or my kids over here rotting in the right seat of this, and then they're going nowhere, and they're pulling from all these non-UAX carriers from the military, and, you know, this is supposed to be my job. So it sounds like um, what could potentially happen in the next couple of years is the vast majority of classes are going to be filled with aviate people. Yeah, that's the plan is, is that, you know, I know that there was a lot of skepticism about the UX carriers keeping people from flow. Um, and that's because we had this, this, this flow rate, this metering that, that was taking place. And we were very, very transparent that, um, what that looked like. It was 2% of the AV population at the carrier every month, which created, uh, a four year type flow. Um, but I also want to end the fact that. Uh, we have commitments from our pilot hiring team, from flight operations, that AVA is the top priority when we still our classes. So right now we're in a world of growth, right? But at some point, it, we're not going to be hiring thousands of pilots every year, and that's right. going to shrink. And we have the commitment that the first people to fill our classes before we bring anyone else in is going to be through the AVA program. So there is a world that we're going to live in, you know, four, five, six years from now, when anyone who thinks that taking a path through an LCC or through a competitor regional is going to be the way to get to it, it could be where United is only bringing people through AVA and as well uh, the military. We are going to set up a military program that we hope to launch in the next two months or so that provides the same level of opportunity to active servicemen and women. It will sit outside of AVA because they will have uh, the same type of requirements uh, to transition. But uh, between aviate participants and the military, one day that could be the only people that are making it to United. Okay. That was my next question. Maybe if it becomes such a dominant force, what about our, our wonderful men and women that have served? So outstanding. Good. Okay. Uh, let's poke another bear. Uh, example, a friend of mine uh, 
you know, uh, son or daughter is uh, through a, a, a participating college, but they basically got hired by a regional. And when they got to the regional, they opted in at the regional, say, last year. OK, so they were already in Aviate. Well, they, they, they opted into Aviate. They got accepted in after they got their job at the regional. OK, so they've been there for eight or nine months. And now these new program changes come along. So what happens to them? They they got hired by whatever participating UAX carrier, accepted into Aviate last year. What happened? Yeah, so it's really what what we've done and what we've taken a lot of time and a lot of thought and how we uh, brought about these changes and what it would mean for those that are already in the pro- already in the program. So um, through some really great work by the team, we've been able to provide what we call best of both worlds. So what I mean by that is we took what AV would have looked like had we not made any changes and we took those flow rates and where they fit um, based on their AVA date and when they came over um, in that list. And we forecasted that all the way out for everyone that was in uh, at the UX carrier at the time. We said, based on this, including the fact that you joined AVA early and that you entered to a university entry point and how much time we believe you'll get, this is going to be your transition time frame. So we provided those transition dates. I think it's like a three month period. We say, based on everything we know, if we never change the program, this is when you want to come over. And we've set that in stone. We provided that to our participants. And then we made these changes. And we and what we've said is, if you complete the requirements of the original program, this is when you'll transition and we'll keep that commitment and we'll bring you over. However, if you feel you can meet these new requirements sooner, please, by all means, go for it. And once you've met those, and those are hours that count after March 1st, we'll transition you based on the commitments that we just talked about earlier. So for, for anyone who's already in the program, um, we, we have set it up in a manner that no one is going to be worse off by these changes. The only thing that we have done to tweak what these legacy um, requirements were, were anyone that has, I believe, a expected date, flow date that's beyond a year from now, we've asked them to move to the left seat to help prime the pump for exactly the issue we're talking about, or many people are sitting in the right seat and not getting those hours. So we've asked those participants to move to the left seat and fly 500 hours. But for those that have already met the requirements uh, based on the old program that didn't necessarily require captain upgrade, we're not going to move the goalpost on them and say, oh, we know you've met all the requirements to transition. Now you're just waiting for your date. We're going to out now ask you to go and do this. That is not the case. Um, those pilots can, can can continue to sit in the right seat if they'd like, and they will transition based on that date that we've shared with them. Another thing that we've done um, to to make sure that we are considering all the pilots that are already in the program who have class dates in the next couple of months at those UX carriers who may see this and feel like, oh, well, I haven't gotten a transition uh, a date or estimate um, because you've already handed them out. And now I'm going to be at a carrier in a month. I've already committed to come to one of your UX partners for this very reason. We're actually going to take anyone that comes to a UX carrier uh, before or up to June 30th and do the same thing for them and provide them the best of both worlds. So uh, we'll wait till June 30th to get everyone in. We'll do the same forecasting that we did before. We'll provide them a transition date. And then they can either transition to United based on that date, or they can do it based on the new PIC requirement and within four months of meeting that transition requirement. Okay. So again, you have someone that got on with one of the UAS carriers, say last summer, and they are now in, they were in Aviate pretty much immediately when they got there. Um, So what I read in the new document, they, I think they were told around, June or so 2025 was their transition date. So still another two plus years to go. Um, Their requirements, bachelor degree, 1,000 hours PIC with the UAX carrier, 2,000 hours total time with the UAX carrier. Is this right? And then it had been at least 24 months there. They have to, well, no, sorry. It's either a bachelor's degree or 1,000 hours PIC. There you go. Yes. Yes. Plus 2,000 total time plus 24 months so yes um i know i know one or two examples of some folks that are in this situation and they've been at the uas carriers for about nine months and have a whopping 300 hours because they're on reserve not flying 
So if this continues for them and they don't fly much and they can't upgrade, they're still stuck with that 2025 transition date. However, if things change and they can hit 2000 hours and already have a bachelor degree um, and two years, which would be for them 2024, then they could they could transition earlier. They could they so, could hit they could hit that goalpost earlier. So what I would say is that transition within four months and meeting the requirements is based on that PIC new the new okay. world that we live in. Okay. The transition dates is based on that AVA list where we've calculated out what it would be if we never trained changed anything. So the idea of someone meeting let's say those requirements a year before their transition date, if we never changed anything they would still be sitting behind all the people that entered AVA before them. So even if there is a participant who meets all the requirements of the old program, they still will be, be held at that carrier or fly for that carrier until they until that transition date that we've provided okay. because there are a number of participants in front of them that we are getting through based on that uh, old slow roll. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. It's a, uh, we just can't, we've got to get all these other people through ahead of so but the, the so but i guess the problem is though is we're still one comment uh, on social media of this was hey if we if we hired 2500 pilots and only 250 of them were aviate um why can't we increase that percentage of aviate that we're bringing into class dates to move up those those dates that were thrown a couple of years out. You know, if you're hiring a, you know, all these pilots, why can't we pull more from the AVA pipeline of people that are, say, ready? Or are you? The dates these people are hitting their qualifications, they're coming on. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So what we have actually done in the last years doubled that flow rate. So we're bringing people out of there as fast as we can. But what you've also mentioned is the more that we bring people out, especially many of them are captains, that's going to make it even harder for our participants in the right seat to get the hours they need right. to transition. So this is like this really complicated ecosystem of sure we can help you know an extra pilot or two or three a month, but we're pulling from that left seat, and now we've hurt many many more pilots who are trying to get in the right seat and earn hours in the right seat. So uh, this is where we've done incredibly close collaboration with our own team at United, our commercial team to understand what is going to be best for our participants. And 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 moving people to the left seat is really gonna prime that pump and not taking so many that we've just decimated that opportunity in the right seat. Yeah, okay. So basically, if you've got a bachelor degree and you're sitting in the right seat of one of the participating UH carriers and you've been in the pipeline for say a year, the date that they were given last year or whenever, how long it takes you guys to calculate that date, they're not going to beat that date by with the pipeline. The only way they could beat that date is to apply outside the pipeline. If they got an interview before that date they were given, then they just got to flip the coin and decide whether or not oh, they want to take a risk and go interview or keep their guaranteed 2025 20, class date. I, I will say, I'll say there are actually two ways that you can remain in AVA and beat that date. One is um, if you can move to the left seat. And for those, if the 1,200 hours applies to them, mm -hmm. get 1,200 hours, then we'll bring you over. The The forecast date is only if you want to stay and meet the requirements of the, the previous program. So for someone that has only been at the carrier for, for nine months, I believe they'd probably be primed to fly for another few months, get up to their 1,000 hours, move to the left seat, get 1,200 or 600 more hours, and be at United in four months. They might beat that transition date. Well, the the junior FOs at at least one of the carriers I know of aren't. They're get they've got three hundred hours last year because they're sitting reserve and not flying. Yeah, and that's why we're doing these changes because we see that's that that was happening. So there was a massive imbalance between captains and FOs. Uh, you know, our participants, you know, want to be hired by these carriers and they are hiring them. But when you have you know hundreds of more of FOs than you do captains, they're just not flying. So so this will help correct that. Yeah. Um, the other at the other way that that date can can be beaten um, isn't going to be up to the participant. However, we also uh, um, uh, have forecasted these dates. Things can happen over time, and if for some reason people decide that they don't want to be an aviator anymore, and they do it, you know, they decide to go elsewhere, uh, they drop out of the program, they try traditionally, and those eighty-eight numbers lessen. 
we're going to do the best we can to backfill to a certain point that, that we're capable of. So we could see for someone that has a transition date that's two years out, we could see that march forward a couple months over the next year or two. Okay. Um, what happens if the industry does what it does, which is about every year, eight years, it takes a dive. Um, we've all seen it in my 27 years. I've seen it three times. Um, you can no longer meet that four months. Your requirements are done, right? Because we're not hiring or we're furloughing. What, what happens to those people? Um, just they go in limbo, but they're still in line or do we have a contingency plan? It is a really great question. And, and when we designed this program, we had to take a, a long look at, do we design it to be maybe less attract, attractive now for everything that could ever happen? Or we design it for what we foresee at least the next four or five years. And, you know, you, the, 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 the meetings that you, you see Scott have and, um, and, and our commitments out there, we, we don't see that happening, but we all know we didn't see COVID happening either and things like that can, which is why being in the AV program is so important because these are the pilots that we are hiring first. And if there is a downturn and that uh, we're not able to meet that four month commitment, that's something we need to take a look back at the program, but we weren't gonna design it in a manner that protected for that and kind of ruined it for everyone else in the time being. Um, if you look at you know our, our growth strategy, we're hiring thousands of pilots every year, the next couple of years. And then when you look at just at retirements alone, it's six, 700 pilots a year. And AV will, will have plenty of opportunity, those participants to just fill the retirement spot. So um, if we ever get into a position where the, the, the main line um, isn't hiring, the number of participants that are meeting those requirements, then we're, we're in a world of mess as an industry. Yeah. But uh, we had we had a lot of discussions um, with a lot of people in finance and commercial and flat ops, and we didn't make that commitment lightly. My team wasn't willing to put their name on something and put something out there um, uh, in hopes that it would be true. We have every absolutely every expectation to bring every participant over that meets those new requirements within four months. Um, did Alpa have any role in developing Aviate? Yeah, Alpa, when, when we first started, when I first joined the team, Alpa was heavily involved with the the, the uh, not only the development, but the rollout and the launch of it. Uh, we have weekly or bi-weekly meetings with Alpa. Um, we shared with Alpa uh, these changes, um, you know, uh, took in their feedback, discussed, made sure that, you know, they were comfortable enough that when we launched it, that, you know, we are we are okay to to say that this was in coordination with them and, and they agreed. Um, so, so yeah, they, they've been a great partner in all of this. Um, one of the complaints, is there such thing as an aviate coach? Can someone be an aviate coach? Is that a thing? Oh, that's a really good question. Yes. It's, it's the one aspect of the program in which I feel comfortable saying that aviate is a pilot career development program. I really feel, you know, when people call it a, a recruitment program or even just a pathway program that they're, um, uh, not exactly even the full aspect of what Aviate provides. So yes, so uh, currently for those that join Aviate before coming to UAX, we'll all get Aviate coaches. Aviate coach is a United pilot that has at least one year of experience at United. Um, now that requires us because of the large number of people that we have in the program to have several hundred coaches who are all going through coach training, um, so we've limited it to just those that are pre UAX. The team is currently working on expanding that to everyone in the program, including those that are at UAX. That requires several hundred more coaches, more training. We want to give a consistent experience. Uh, but the pro coaching program is something that's really cool and unique uh, to the aviate program. Okay. Uh, and one uh, piece of feedback I got when I kind of ran the idea of the flag pull up of this interview was hey, I'm a coach, I've emailed. Uh, several times trying to get some answers and, and whoever I'm emailing is non-responsive. So run that through your team. It sounds like we need to make sure the communication between the the program and the coaches are good because I have actually heard more than one people with that problem. 
Yeah, I would love it. if you can give me the, the example of that because uh, shortly before this, I looked at um, all of the emails that we get. And we have we have several inboxes. One of them is av at united dot com. So if anyone's listening and wanna wants to ask a question, uh, we've had twelve thousand um, questions emails come through that email address, and our average response rate is four days. Um, and I think there is only four days and two hours. I think there's only a hundred open cases of that twelve thousand. So there is there is a team of uh, of two that that just that's that's their job. And that's what they go through is answering those questions. The coaching has a different email address, and I looked and we had uh, over five hundred inquiries through that email address, and I think there were about four or five that were open. So for some reason, if it was sent through that email, the right email address, um, it's either one of those four or five, which I doubt that it is, or somehow they believe it was closed. So I would love to be able to go back to look at that specific one and, and see right. where it uh, fell through the cracks. Yeah. All right. So uh, bottom line, um, you know, a lot of people, I've uh, one person asked me, hey, ask, ask these guys, what about tracking our son or daughter through the program? Well, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory right now. How's your flight training coming? You know, where, what's your entry point? Uh, you know, where's your flight time? Uh, are you at the UX carrier 135 or the flight training center yet? Um, and do you have the PIC time at the carrier, either the 1600 or the 12, if you, if you're one of the four entry points, the 1200. So really it's kind of, it's, it's basically self-explanatory is how you're doing. Yeah. We try to simplify the the program. So it is that case. We, we want to remove all those if and or statements that, that you mentioned earlier about oh, you can stay in the right seat if this, or move to the left seat, then that. So by removing that, we do have the credit, which is you know one aspect, but that was really important to us. Um, and there are other areas that do require a little nuance when calculating um, your progress. For example, we do give credit for those pilots that, de- that decide to take a full-time management or union position while at that cure. We know that that is very important to a pilot's development. We at United appreciate those pilots that take on those roles and have that expertise. And we don't want someone not to take that role because it's going to hinder their fly- flying and their progression. So in the new program, we actually award 70 hours of flight time credit towards their transition if they take on that role. Same thing. Each month. Those, correct. What's that? 70 hours a month. 70 hours a month. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. And then we also uh, provide... Uh, credit for those that are ground instructors and line check airmen, you know. So uh, we, we want to make sure that we are encouraging people to also take on on those roles. That's where it gets a little complicated, and that's why we're really excited to launch our Aviate app that will allow someone to put in, all right, this is my role, this is my flight time, these are the months in service of you know this this job, um, and we will do all the calculation on the app. And it will spit right. back out what that progression is towards those transition requirements. Does someone that is, um, you know, gone through, say, an Auburn and then got the job as an FTI? Okay, uh, they did their they flight instructed some, then they hit the uh, and the FTI at the training center. What's that requirement? Yeah, so that is a a whole separate document because there is a there is a, a lengthy level of requirements that someone who does. The FTI role and transition that way would need to do to, to come over. Um, it includes, it does have a college education requirement. Um, it is uh, three years as an FTI. There are um, aspects of training, like attending captain upgrade, attending in doc, um, a frequency in which they need to do jump seats. Uh, they're in the coaching program and that has a requirement. So there's several things that they need to do while being an FTI that's outside of the normal role of being an FTI that prepares them to come to United. Okay. Um, is there a flight time requirement on there? Uh, beyond yeah, the seven of their unrestricted ATP. Okay. Um, is there a, is there a chance that after March 1st, uh, let's say you've got somebody that's a, a, a captain at one of our regionals, got a couple thousand hours as a captain there and sees that, Hey, they God, they just made these program changes. I already qualify completely with all these and they apply for the AVA pipeline. They get accepted um, and they do so they're already qualified, right? They've already hit that 1600 hours PIC. Um, 
could they potentially get hired prior to people in the aviate pipeline before them no so the the new requirement if they aren't current, currently in aviate today and they're a captain of ux carrier i think i'm reading this back properly and they decide they want to now be an aviate and they get into the aviate program their pic time only counts while you're in the aviate program so the next 1600 hours is what they're yes. going to have to have yes okay um and they also have to have two years at the carrier or in the program there's no we we've we've tried to simplify and we've gotten rid of any okay. time-based requirement so it's That's strictly right. um the the pic time and what's also great about this is it has a built-in direct and captain program to it right yeah. so we've had to create these separate commitments and dec programs that now we don't so if there's someone at a competitor uh regional or someone at a an lcc that is seeing this and they are they qualify to be a direct entry captain at one of our uax carriers they can come over on day one at that carrier uh come into aviate by 1600 hours and they're at united okay all right but someone that's been in the pipeline for a year or two already should not ever get hired after someone that is in, entered into this pipeline Jan, uh, march 1st or later I mean, if that person's currently at a university right now. Right, right. As long so as they're they, flying. Yeah. Or or doing one of those other things, getting the requirements. Okay. Anything else you'd like to share with us about how the program is, or did we kind of beat that horse to death? No, no. <laughs> no um, this has been fabulous to be able to share in this manner. The team takes a lot of time trying to write communications or set up web pages in a way that I think gets a lot of this information across and they have to be very precise about the language. And I know it often looks like legalese and it's uh, it's written with bullets and sub bullets and even sub sub bullets and it can get quite confusing. So just the opportunity to talk about the program in a in what I believe is a, a clear, concise manner, uh, I, I think is very helpful. So appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, and we'll I'll link the uh the ABA program guide, the new 2023 guide dated March 1st of 23. I'll link that in the show notes on for YouTube. So if anybody's watching this on YouTube, you should be able to download it from there. Um, well, very good. Perry, hey, I appreciate your time. Thanks for all your uh, hard work on Aviate. And uh, let's just see how it goes. Hopefully the industry keeps rolling along and we can, you know, welcome all these new pilots on the property. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. 